as we are wrapping up tonight the uh, uh, three denials of Peter in regard to his relationship or even knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ where he was trying to save his own hide in fear of his own physical harm and destruction as Jesus Christ was now being uh, tried and also persecuted at the hands of the Jewish leadership. As we know in verses 54 through 62 we have this narrative. Tonight we're going to focus on verses 61 and 62 uh, to begin. But all of this is also paralleled in all of the Gospels, the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and also John. So now as we turn to uh, verse 61, here we see the look of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. After Peter had denied him three times, Jesus Christ turns, looks at him, and then we hear the cock crowing or the rooster crowing, and then is when Peter knows that he is self-condemned, that he is actually fulfilled the prophecy of Jesus Christ that he would deny him three times, even though he vehemently denied that he would ever do that. He would go to death, he would go to prison, etc., etc. But now he has denied him three times, and it is known especially by our Lord. But again, Peter should also know it was always known by our Lord because Jesus knew and knows everything because he is God. But in any case, we see the powerful look here, and then we see Peter self-condemning, recognizing that he is guilty of fulfillment of this prophecy. So let's read the narrative one last time this evening. In verse 54, it says, And having arrested him, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. So here in Luke's narrative, it begins the trials of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we complete what we're going to note tonight, we're going to get back into those trials. But in between, Luke gives us the narrative of Peter and his denial. He says, But Peter was following at a distance. And after they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, again at the palace of the high priest, and had sat down together, Peter was sitting among them. So Peter took his seat with the unbelievers in the fire, and rather than taking his seat on the throne of victory with the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 56, And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the firelight and looking intently at him, said, This man was with him too. In verse 57, But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, another saw him and said, You are one of them too. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after about an hour had passed, another man began to insist, saying, Certainly this man was also with him, for he is a Galilean too. And we know from the other Gospels, because of the accent that they recognized, that he was from the uh, epicenter or the genesis of Jesus' ministry, and he was one of the disciples too. Then in verse 60, but Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, a cock crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, before a cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So here we see Peter's denial in the culmination of our Lord looking at him. Once the cock had crowed, Peter knew that his fate was sealed. He had fulfilled the prophecy uh, that Jesus Christ had given, that he vehemently denied, as I said before. But what this did for Peter was give him a memory jog, as it says, and Peter remembered. You see, Peter had previously heard the word of God from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who prophesied during the Passover supper that these things would take place. And when our Lord just turned and looked at Peter, all that came rushing back into his memory, and all the doctrine that he had learned in regard to this situation was now brought to the fore, and Peter found himself guilty of this sin and this very egregious sin of denying a relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And oh, how powerful a look can be as I have up here on the board. And just think about that sometimes. You see, you always, you don't always have to use your words to convey a message in regard to someone's sin or the evil or the human good and wickedness that they're getting involved in. Sometimes all it takes is a look. But remember, that look is backed up by what? 
previous information of teaching Bible doctrine that should have been learned by the individual. And then when that uh, information is learned by the individual, whether they apply it or not is not the issue at that point in time. But they have the information. They know what to do, what not to do. They know that they should be doing certain things or not doing other things. And yet when they have a failure, a fall, stumble, and trip like Peter did here, sometimes you don't have to then big, take out the big ruler and beat them over the head and scold them. Sometimes it just takes a look. And again, it doesn't have to be a I told you so kind of look, okay? You don't have to be an idiot about it or a jerk about it, okay? Sometimes it's just a look like, there it is, okay? There it is. So a look can sometimes be powerful. So in our witnessing, in our evangelizing, after we have delivered information to other individuals and they have accepted it or not at that time, at least they've heard it. And now if a situation comes up that is related to that word that you have previously given to them, you don't have to say, I told you so, okay? Jesus didn't do that. He didn't put his hands on his hips and start wagging his head and his tail and saying, I told you so, okay? He just gave him a look. And there it was. And it all came rushing back into Peter's soul. And it came back into his memory. And he now understood what Jesus Christ was saying. Also keep in mind here that Peter was a believer, a positive believer, who was keen to the intake of the Word of God. So for him, he didn't need the big, you know, the big stick. He didn't need the bat over the head, as it were, or the Bible thumping in this situation. All as he needed was a look. So in our witnessing and evangelizing, we too have to have discernment as to what each individual needs. Sometimes it will be, here's the Word of God. You need to communicate a little bit more. Other times it will be just a look. And that will be enough. And leave it at that. And let the Holy Spirit have His ministry of conviction as it says that His is His ministry for the church age. You see, sometimes we try to get in God's way. We try to do all of God's work. And sometimes less is more. And when you do less and you stand back and let God do the rest of the work, you have greater effect, greater output as a result. But if you're trying to do all the work all the time, you're really just getting in God's way, and sometimes you're frustrating the will of God in the situation. So sometimes it only takes a look and just do that little bit of, you know, evangelizing, witnessing or whatever the case may be. But sometimes less is more and just give the look and let it be and let God do the work because it's his responsibility when it's all said and done, not yours. We're just vessels to do the will of God. Sometimes he'll move you to do more, but also listen for him to tell you, hold back, do less. Don't go all the way. Now, again, don't use your own uh, you know, self-consciousness or your fear, your worry, and anxiety to let that voice talk to you in regard to that situation. Don't use that excuse for why you don't witness. But again, have discernment and listen to the leading ministry of God the Holy Spirit and then open your mouth or keep it shut based on the situation that you may be in. Jesus Christ didn't need to give Peter a great discourse right now, didn't need to give him a scolding finger. All he needed to do is turn and look at him. There it is, as I just said a few hours ago. There it is. And sometimes that will happen to you as well. It will be that quick sometimes. Other times it will be a longer duration. But you still have an opportunity to follow up with the lesson that it was previously given in regard to the Word of God. You see, Peter not only learned here through the uh, the eye gate of the look, but he also learned through the ear gate of the cock crowing. And so as we take in the word of God, we can either take it in through the eyes or we take it in through the ears. If somebody happens to be blind, certainly we have braille, things like that. There are different ways of learning for different people. But we say the eye gate and the ear gate for the majority. And that is how we learn the word of God. We either read it or we're taught it uh, uh, through an audible a mode of operation. Peter learned in both situations. He learned through the teaching of Jesus Christ, but then he learned about his failure when the look of Jesus 
came back at him. He saw Jesus with his eyes. They made eye contact, and there it was. And then at the same time, he heard the cock crow, or as, as Luke gives it to us, the cock crowed first. Then he looked at uh, Jesus, so Jesus looked at him, and then Peter knew. And those two subtle things were the great memory jog for Peter in this situation where the word of God came rushing back into his soul and now he understood like he never did before. And that will happen to you too. So now put yourself in the position of Peter because we all fail from time to time, but all of us, again, in our ministry here are taking in the Word of God on a consistent basis. And we know the Word of God and we should know better about the things of life. But yet if we trip up and we fail, we just wait for those little memory jogs that God will bring into our lives that bring the Word back to recall so that we can apply it to the situation. And then when we recognize that we have failed, now's the time to take action. Now's the time to take action, to rebound and recover. Now, Peter here, as we're going to see, had great remorse. He had great sorrow. He cried bitterly. We're going to see that uh, in the next passage coming up. And then he ran away. He did what Peter does. He runs. But yet he came back very quickly after that. So he's still in the mode. I've failed. I've been caught in the failure. I'm going to run away. I'm going to hide. But then when he had a little bit of time to think about it, then he came back around. And by the time Jesus Christ raised, was raised from the dead, on that third day, Peter then comes running back to the Lord and meets him at the tomb. So it's kind of interesting when you think about the whole picture. First we see Peter running away twice, but then we see him running back to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And sometimes we'll do that too. Sometimes we'll run away because of our failure, because of our sin, because of the guilt and the remorse that we have within our soul. But even if you're running away, remember, you can always run back to the Lord. And at some point, stop running away. Stop running away. And now get to the point where you're running to the Lord to be with Him, to meet Him, and to have relationship with Him once again. And you do that because you remember that your sins are forgiven and they've been paid for at the cross of Jesus Christ. So here we have the recall of Bible doctrine uh, in uh, Peter's soul. Again, the prophecy that Jesus made, that is Bible doctrine. I'm going to show you again. Uh, you know, well, we've already talked about the prophecies from Old Testament into the New Testament. We've, and we're going to see more prophecies in the next section about Jesus' overall uh, 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 affair that is going on here where he's about to be abused, he's about to be uh, beaten, he's about to be verbally and mentally challenged, all prophesied from the Old Testament, which he conveyed to his disciples uh, during their ministry. So they learned the doctrine. Now they just need to recall the doctrine. And again, the old Seinfeld thing, you can take the res you can take the reservation, but you can't hold the reservation, okay? Well, we can take the doctrine, but we have to recall the doctrine in order for it to be powerful within our lives. And that's what this word here for remembered is all about. He remembered the word of the Lord. In other words, he remembered Bible doctrine. Even though it was a prophecy, remember, prophecy too is Bible doctrine. We have lots of prophecy in, this, in the scriptures. It is Bible doctrine because it is the word of God. So here again, we have a compound uh, uh, word for emphasis, hupo mimnesco, and that does mean to remember, to bring to remembrance, and to remind. The root word there, mimnesco, uh, all by itself means to recall and to remember. Then you put the prefix on hupo there, that means around or about, okay? So it's talking about the whole cycle. The whole process of remembrance going on here at this point in time. And all of this came rushing back into Peter's memory at this point. It's interesting when we look at this word by itself within the New Testament, it is used seven times, again, seven, the number of spiritual perfection. Uh, twice it's used in the Gospels, here and then in John chapter 14, verse 26, which I'm going to show you in a minute, which too is a very important passage in regard to remembering Bible doctrine. But then it's used five other times uh, throughout the epistles of the New Testament that also talk about 
doctrine being taught that needs to be remembered, okay? So again, all, uh, always as this word is taught within or used within the scripture, it talks about recalling the word of God. So Luke uses it for the first time in the New Testament. Again, first mentioned principle, very important application here. As Peter now is recalling Bible doctrine through these little memory jogs that came uh, to him, the look and the rooster crowing. And then we see in John 14, 26, where it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. You see, this was a promise that Jesus Christ was making to his apostles and disciples during the upper room discourse, the Passover supper that we just uh, studied and understood. And he was speaking of the ministry of the Holy Spirit that was to come for the church age. So again, reminding his disciples of these things, but also a doctrine for the church age. That when the Holy Spirit comes, He is the one that teaches us the Word. He is the one that helps us to remember and recall the Word of God so that we can apply it within our lives. And that's why He's called the Parakletos, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in the name of Jesus. He will teach you all things. That's the grace apparatus for perception. And bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. That's the application of Bible doctrine. So that the information called gnosis in the Greek, data that came into your soul, can go out as Sophia, wisdom within your soul. And while it's circulating through your soul, there's that Greek word epinosis or knowledge or full knowledge of that word. But when you apply that word to your life, it then becomes wisdom, Sophia, practical knowledge for you to use and apply each and every day. And that's the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. And so again, go back to the discussion we had at the beginning about just a little subtle look. You know, give room for the Holy Spirit because it's his ministry. He's the one that teaches. He's the one that brings to remembrance. He's the one that takes data called the words in the Bible and turns it into wisdom in your life so that you can apply it to overcome the problems, the difficulties, uh, uh, you know, the mountains, the details, whatever the case may be, to overcome everything in life so that you are an overcomer. You are, you are a winner believer. Rather than being a loser believer who does not know the word of God and you find yourself in sin and turmoil throughout your life. So this passage embodies that whole doctrine of the grace apparatus for perception as Pastor Thien put together is a great doctrine for how we take in the word of God either through the eye gate or the ear gate and it comes in as data it cycles through our soul it is stored uh, you know within our human spirit and the right lobe of our soul called the heart or the kadia in the scriptures and that word is in the heart of our soul and when it's there we then can apply it to life situations but even that is through the power of God the Holy Spirit. And we have a power during the church age that is unique to all believers uh, throughout all the other generations. Some believers had the power and the filling of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, during uh, the Old Testament, usually the prophets and the writers of the Scripture. Now every believer of the church age gets that grace gift. And we have that gift so that we can learn, understand, and apply the Word of God to our lives on a consistent basis. So that we don't have to be in the doldrums. We don't have to have fear, worry, and anxiety. We don't have to be depressed and downtrodden. And even when we fail like Peter failed, we don't have to run like rats. Instead, we can stand firm and recognize that we are forgiven. And our sin has been paid for through the cross of Jesus Christ. And we are restored to fellowship immediately. You see, Peter, it took him a while to figure out, I still have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, as Jesus Christ continued through his trials, pre Peter now is nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. And not mentioned again until the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not at the crucifixion, not at the burial. He's not there. Unfortunately, he ran at this point in time. 
But then, after a while, he figured it out. And he understood that he was forgiven. And he understood that he should not have this remorse of defeat. And especially when he heard that the Lord had been raised, he understood the victory that is in Jesus Christ, that he now can have too. And he ran back to the Lord. And so now that we know all this information about what Jesus has done for the cross and his resurrection to glory uh, and uh, uh, the victory that he has won, that is now given to us because we have believed, we don't have to run away from God. Because God is always there to what? Restore you. To restore you, to restore you, to restore you. But what you need to do is do what? Remember. (laughs) And let the Holy Spirit have his ministry of remembrance in you. Again, remember. And sometimes that remembrance is going to start with, hey, confess your sin. Confess it, name it to God, know that you're cleansed, now go forward. And then from there, start to go forward. And remember the other doctrines that are applied and those problem-solving devices that we talk about that God has given to us. And not only those, but the other hundreds of promises that are found in the Scripture that we can apply to our situation so that we walk in victory every day. Unfortunately, in our day and age, I see too many believers that are walking as losers. And they're downtrodden, and they're not upbeat, they're not joyful, they're not happy, they're not friendly, and they become recluse, they get sidetracked by the world. And my wife and I, as we were talking, uh, you know, today, you know, coming over, we just turned on the news a little bit uh, while we had dinner before we came. You know, the news is designed to depress you, okay? I'm sorry, people. The news is designed to depress you including Fox News that you probably all love. It's there to depress you. It's part of Satan's cosmic system. And it's not about who is right and who is wrong. Okay? And they want to make one side right, they want to make the other side wrong. So do all the other networks. And they're all fighting for an audience but they're all fighting for an audience to fight the other side of the audience and to get you mad about what that one's doing and get them mad about what this one is doing. It's all part of Satan's cosmic system. You've got to get rid of it. <laughs> You've got to get rid of it from the mentality of your soul. Again, if you can't separate mentally, separate physically. Don't turn it on. Don't turn it on. Just stay away. It's designed to depress you. But with the word of God resonant within your soul, you should have divine viewpoint and be an overcomer. And again, when you hear of this or you hear of that, you can put it into the grand perspective of what the word of God, Bible doctrine, has brought back into remembrance about what life is all about and what the eternity, eternal state is all about. You see, our life isn't here to be Republican or Democrat in the United States of uh, America. We're not designed to be one or the other. You see, we're not even citizens of this United States of America. Positionally, we're citizens of heaven, where there is no right and left, north or south, <laughs> east or west, okay? <laughs> However you want to say it but we are one in Christ. And Satan is designing a world to tear people apart. And it's so funny because he wants to tear the world apart, but yet when the Antichrist comes on to the scene during the tribulation, he wants everybody to be one and sing a big kumbaya at that point in time. But it's under his power and authority and control. And that's why he's going to fail. Because for generations he's been teaching people Fight against each other. Fight against this one. Fight against that one. Fight this. Fight that. Be angry. Be upset. Don't believe your politicians. And yet now he's going to want them all to believe him. And it ain't going to work. Simply for that reason that it's counter to what he's been doing for generations. So in any case, 
I, div I, I digress. When we have the word of God resident within our soul, we have divine viewpoint. And we are not allowing the things of this world. We're not allowing, you know, uh, the Satan's cosmic system, even the problems and difficulties of this world to bring us down. We are allowing the word of God to lift us up, seated at the right hand of God the Father. And again, if you want to be so caught up in the politics of this world, including the, you know, the European Economic Union or the World Forum or any of these other satanic United Nations and things like that that are out there that you may be thinking about and pointing to and how evil they are. Guess where you're sitting? By the fire. You're sitting by the fire as they all are persecuting our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't sit there. Sit with your Lord seated at the right hand of God which is out of this world. Literally. Not, not just a figurative statement, okay? It's out of this world. That's where you belong. That's where you're from. That's who you are. Do you know you're the bride of Jesus Christ, God incarnate, the Savior of the world? Do you know that? Do you believe it? Do you understand it? Do you walk in that? Or are you a citizen of this world? and caught up in the problems and the difficulties and the details of this life. You see, we wonder why churches are failing, Christianity is failing within the United States of America, because we're more caught up in politics than we are in Christianity. Oh, we try to put our Christianity into politics. It doesn't belong there. Did Jesus Christ ever say, rebel against the Romans? No. What was he dealing with? The religious leaders who are teaching false doctrine. And again, our secular leaders can say all they want. Rome believed in multiple gods. Jesus wasn't fighting them and their apostasy. He was fighting the religious leaders that were teaching about God, but doing it wrong. That's where the fight is. See, we've put our focus in the wrong place. And Satan wants our focus to be in the wrong place. Peter's focus was, I'll be with you to the end. His focus was in the wrong place. Instead of saying, I'll be with you to the end, he should have been saying, thank you, Jesus, for going to the end for me. And what can I do for you? See, that should have been Peter's attitude. But he was all caught up right now in his human good works. Who's the better of the disciples? Who's the better of the apostles? Who's the greatest among us? He was caught up in that, the human good. And he got so caught up in the human good about how great he could be, when they accused him of being one of, uh, with Christ, he absolutely denied it because he didn't want to lose who he was. He didn't want to lose his personage. Person, person, you know the word I'm looking for. Okay? Person of Jews. Whatever. He didn't want to lose that. And then he figured out, I'm fighting the wrong battle. Because it's not about me. It's about my Lord. It's about what he has done, what he is doing, and what he continues to do. Let me just go back. Again, whom the Father will send in my name. The Holy Spirit, the Helper. God does it. God does it. God does it. God does it. He does it all. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. That's the power that we need to have within our lives. That's the strength we need to have in our lives. And when we have that power, when we have that strength, and we see ourselves elevated to the right hand of God the Father in union with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we'll think more important, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll think more impactfully about our church, about the Word of God, spreading the gospel, making sure that His will be done. Not Fox News's will be done. Not MSNBC's will be done. Not the left's nor the right's will be done. And what people fail to forget 
is that when we are focused on our Lord, he'll take care of the politics. He'll take care of the politics. He'll fight the fight. He'll win the battle because he do wants to do what? Bless his people. And he's not going to bless his people who are going forward with evil and wickedness. Whether you think it's coming from the right or the left or both. Which, sorry folks, it is both. Okay? He will take care of it. But if we're more focused on ourselves and on the world and stuff, he's going to let them do what they desire to do because he wants to use it to wake you up. So in any case, Peter had this moment. He recognized his failure. He recognized where he was wrong. He didn't, doesn't correct himself right away, but he does eventually, as we know. But at this point, he's running away. We'll see that again in just a minute. But the power and the filling of God the Holy Spirit leads us to the doctrine within our soul. That's the grace apparatus for perception. You see, the Holy Spirit leads us, leads us, leads us. Just take in the Word. Make yourself available. And as you're positive to the intake of the Word of God and you believe the Word of God, as it comes into your soul, the Holy Spirit will store it in your soul. And then when it comes time to apply that Word, you'll have it right there, ready to go. And you'll use it. But if you're trying to do it on your own, through your own human good works, like Peter was at this point, it's going to be like me trying to remember people's names. Uh, what's, your, what's your name? What's your name? What, I can't remember names for the life of me. Okay? It takes me a long time to get somebody's name down. It's just a thing I have. Okay? But with the Word of God, it can be like that. Not the name, but the Word of God. Okay? <laughs> The Word of God comes and it comes and it comes and it comes and it's right there and He brings it to your remembrance because it's divine power, not human power. So again, if we make ourselves available to the Word of God and, and the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, it will cycle through our soul. And when we learn that Word through the eye gate, through the ear gate, however it's coming in, and we're positive towards that Word, it will cycle through. And the Holy Spirit does the job. He does the job. And that's why, again, we've had people in our congregation over the years. We've been here 22 years now, okay? Over the years where individuals are technically mentally challenged and they've sat in the seats. And I've seen those individuals be able to quote Scripture and talk Scripture better than those who may be a CFO of a company. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit. It's the power of God, not the power of us or you. It's the power of God, and they can do it, and God can do it, and He can do that in you. We just have to let Him, and sometimes get out of the way. <laughs> get out of the way. And let the, let the Spirit have His way within your soul. Yield to the Spirit. Yield to His ministry. Yield to His working. Yield to His will and plan in the application of that Word consistently. He will bring it back to your remembrance. And remember, the caveat there, too, is your positive volition first had to put you in the presence of learning it through the eye gate or the ear gate so that the Holy Spirit can work with something. Remember, it also tells us in the Scriptures He will speak only what He hears. You see, the Holy Spirit knows every jot and tittle of the Word of God, right? Knows every aspect of it because it's His thinking too. He knows it all. But the Bible tells us He'll only teach you what you hear. So it's not a supernatural thing where all the doctrine comes into your soul because you believe Jesus. No. It comes because you've presented yourself as positive towards the Word, made yourself available to the teaching ministry of God the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit in you has heard that Word being taught. Now He can use it. And if it were 
any other way, it would not be righteous or just. Because it's not just for God to put the Word of God into somebody's soul who's negative towards the Word of God, doesn't want to hear the Word of God. It's not just and righteous to do that. That would be a coercion. It would be a, a, a penalty or a foul in the angelic conflict. But if you present yourself positive towards the Word of God and take it in, now He can use that information. And He will. And continue to be positive as you go forward. And let the ministry of the Holy Spirit work within you. And let it be applied to your life so that it does become wisdom. And so then in verse 62, we see Peter's current reaction when he's caught red-handed. Cock crowed. Jesus looked. He remembers the doctrine. <laughs> in this case, it's a rut row moment, okay? I just messed up royally. Just messed up royally. That's okay, too. Because it's good to know that you've messed up. You ever think about that? It's good to know that you have messed up. It's when we mess up and we don't know it. It's when we mess up or we try to ignore it. Try to hide from it, run from it. That's when it's not good. You see, we have to have self-accountability. And again, you don't have to go tell the world that you messed up. And certainly we don't tell other people that other people messed up. It's not our responsibility, okay? But I'm talking about between you and God. To recognize that you have messed up, that's a great thing. Why? Because you've recalled doctrine that, if told, that has told you. Oh, that was wrong, what I did. Oh, that's not, you know, in the plan of God. That's not part of the will of God. Because I'm doing this sin or I'm doing this human good thing over here. You see, it's good to know that you have messed up. Because now you've recalled the Word of God that tells you what the right thing to do is. And even though you didn't do it, now you're recalling the Word of God. And you're applying it to your life. So that what? You stop messing up. <laughs> you stop going in that direction, if it's a negative direction, you know, in the will and plan of God. Now, again, Peter's in a unique situation here. Again, none of us are hanging out with the Lord Jesus Christ personally for three years, saying, you're my best friend, you're my best friend. None of us are hanging out with Jesus where he's saying, you're the leader of all these other disciples. You know, you, you know, truly, if they wanted to know of this group who was the greatest, they should have said Peter. They should have said Peter. Because the Lord turned to Peter at every important juncture of his ministry. And every time, you know, he went off, like the Transfiguration, or even in this Garden of Gethsemane, he had Peter and John and James come along with him and get a little further than the rest. He brought them into the fold even closer. So Peter's in a unique situation. And so when Peter denies his Lord, who, you know, he confessed loyalty to and allegiance to till his dying breath, and had the experience of our Lord treating him in such a way, in a more intimate relationship than even the others, and yet he fails royally, he feels pretty bad about it, okay? feels pretty bad about it. And so once he finds and recognizes that he did exactly what Jesus Christ prophesied he would do, that he denied he would ever do, what does he do? Again, for the moment, he runs away. And really what he should have done is hit his knees. <laughs> the Lord's right there. He should have been on his knees and say, Forgive me, Lord, I have wronged you. And all you people around here, he's my guy. <laughs> he's my Lord. I love him, as he's going to say later on in the resurrection of Jesus. You know I love you. Or, you know I got that coming up in a minute. You know I love you. You know I love you. Should have done it right then and there. Should have done it right then and there. But he wasn't quite ready yet. Wasn't quite ready yet. And still had the remorse. He had the guilt. He had fear, anxiety within his soul. He's still operating in sin. And he just sinned it up through, through the de three denials and the compounding of his sin, as we talked about. Making an oath and swearing, not 
a cuss word, but, you know, s- you know swearing, a de- you know, I swear on my mother's grave, which the Word of God tells us not to do. <laughs> he compounded his sin. And so he's still in that mode of operation at this point. He hasn't quite gotten out of it, so he runs. But at the same time, he has guilt upon his soul, and he cries bitterly. Now, the great contrast that we have here, as we're going to see, is Judas Iscariot. And boy, oh boy, do we see a difference. Boy, oh boy, do we see a difference. So when it says Peter wept bitterly, here we have the Greek word uh, kaleo, pikros. Kaleo means wept, and then pikros means bitterly. This word is also used uh, here and in Matthew 26 for the same scene. So Matthew utilizes the same context for Peter uh, weeping bitterly at this point in time. And basically it talks about having mental anguish. You know, he was just so beside himself, his head was just spinning. His head was just spinning. And he was so guilt-ridden from what he had done. But again... He recalled doctrine. It came back into his memory that what he should have done and what he did not do. And so now he's overwhelmed in the mentality of his soul. And so this word picross talks about that mental agony or anguish. And that led him to cry bitterly. Again, guilt, regret, all of those things, which too are sin. Okay? (laughs) They're all sin. What we call this is now an emotional revolt of the soul. Because the soul has been ruling him for some time now. You see, his spirit wasn't ruling him. Bible doctrine was not ruling him. But his emotions and his feelings had been ruling him. In the Passover supper with the great statements, falling asleep and not uh, encouraging Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, denying him three times. His soul was ruling. And his soul now was controlled by his sin nature at this point in time. And it wasn't his spirit that was ruling, and it wasn't the word of God that was ruling. So because he's acting as a soulish man, which is what we call the unbeliever as well, okay, the soulish man, they have no human spirit or the word of God to rely upon or to apply. They only have the sin nature in their human soul to go by. They have no divine power whatsoever. Peter is operating in that mode. And it's interesting, even operating in that mode, Bible doctrine was recalled. And that's another thing, too. (laughs) You can recall Bible doctrine when you are out of fellowship and when you're sinning. Now the question is, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to use it? Are you going to apply it? Or are you just going to say, oh, yeah, I'm doing something, I shouldn't be doing it. Guess what? I'm going to keep doing it and ignore the doctrine. You see, that's the choice we have. So we recall doctrine even when we're out of fellowship. And remember, the Holy Spirit has the convicting ministry to convict us of our sin, our human good, and our evil. And that happens when we are out of fellowship. It happens for the unbeliever when they have no fellowship with God. So you can recall Bible doctrine when you're out of fellowship. Now, what are you going to do with it? Peter didn't apply it yet, okay? He just continued in the mental anguish, the sorrow, the guilt, the fear, the worry, the remorse. And recognizing his own personal failure that Jesus flatly told him, plainly told him to his face about six hours Eight hours ago, half a day, (laughs) told him, you're going to do this. Now he did it. He's like, holy cow, I can't believe I just did that. So Peter's sorrow was not only remorse for the act of denial, but also a a, a repentance that resulted in forgiveness and restoration eventually. But at this very moment in our passage in our scripture, he's not there yet. But our Lord knows his heart. And in John 21, 15 through 19, let's turn there in our Bibles. Let's, go th- let's turn there. Let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 21. Great passage. In 
And here we're seeing our Lord work these things within his soul. And then upon his resurrection, in verse 15, it says, So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? So do you love me? Now, in your notes, I've uh, uh, spelled this out for you a little bit and uh, giving you the detail. And, you know, John, do you love me? Agape love, which is we talk about impersonal, unconditional love. And he says, do you love me more than these? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter uses the word phileo, a personal rapport. I have personal rapport and affection, a personal love for you. Not just an unconditional, impersonal, unconditional love. And then Jesus said to him, feed or tend my lambs, my little baby, my little baby sheep. Take care of them. If you love me, take care of them. Help them. Help the new believers. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, agape. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo, I love you personally. And Jesus said to him, shepherd my sheep. That's the adults, the, the mature believers. Make sure they're, pro they're, they're provided for. Shepherd guards and protects, feeds and waters. Make sure you're doing that. Help my mature believers. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love phileo me? Now Jesus says phileo. Interesting on the third go-round. Do you have a personal, intimate relationship with me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you phileo me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo, I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed or tend my sheep. So again, keep teaching, keep teaching, even the mature believers. And then it goes on to say in verse 18, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. You could fall asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. You could sit by the fire. You could run out of the temple. Wherever you wanted to go, you could do it. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. And I'll, I'll read it because rather than saying it, verse 19. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So as we know from uh, extra biblical scriptures that Peter was crucified upside down uh, in Rome. His hands were stretched out. Somebody else made him go to that place. He didn't desire to, just as Jesus didn't desire to go to the cross, okay? If there's any other way, Father, take this cup from me. Not my will, but your will be done. Same would go for Peter. But Peter would do it, again, also joyously and happily like Jesus did, knowing that it would have great effect. And in Peter's case, knowing that he was dying for his Lord, and he soon would be face to face with his Lord. So again, as Peter is now going forward, Mere sorrow for sin is not the whole of repentance. You can't just feel bad about your sin and think that you're forgiven. All right? Judas Iscariot felt bad about his sin. He felt bad about betraying Jesus. But he never parlayed that into belief that Jesus was his Savior. And what did Judas do? He tried to kill himself. And then that failed. And then, again, the Lord took him when he fell off the cliff. It was in the Lord's timing, not Judas's. So in regard to remorse, again, for him to weep bitterly, that's not enough. You can't just go cry and think that, okay, that's it. You've shown me some remorse. That's enough. No, you've got to change your mind. See, Judas didn't change his mind and come back to the Lord. He tried to run even further away. He thought by killing himself and dying, he would escape the Lord. That tells you how much he didn't know about the Lord, that he was God, and that the unbeliever goes to the lake of fire. Or that upon our death we all meet our maker. That tells you how little Judas thought of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. But on Peter's case, he changed. 
He changed his mode of operation. He changed his way of thinking. And yes, he had remorse, but he used it to repent in such a way that he recognized his failure, and now he wanted to enter back into a relationship with the Lord once again and get back into that relationship. And that's, again, why he ran to the tomb. Once he heard the Lord was resurrected, he couldn't wait to be there, and he ran. So Peter failed the Lord despite his desire and commitment to serve the Lord throughout his entire life. And in the hour of his darkness, the hour of his sin, the hour of the literal darkness, Peter's human good courage failed him. And how brave was Peter up until this point? Now it's just failure after failure to failure. Do you know him? No. Nope. Are you one of them? Absolutely not. Are you from there? Uh, uh, you, you're one of his disciples? I don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. Deny, deny, deny. And his human good failed him because he had no true courage. He had no true inner peace, contentment. And he truly could not stand with the Lord. He couldn't stand side by side at this point in time. Later on, he did. And later on, he did come around. And so after learning that valuable lesson about his failure, learning the lesson that we don't use our human strength, again, divine strength, divine power, the grace apparatus for perception, divine viewpoint, that's what we are to be using. And Peter learned he failed when he used his human good works. He failed, and he failed miserably. Now, sometimes you're going to fail miserably when you try to use your human good works, but sometimes it's going to be more subtly. Okay? But still, learn from that. And then the reality is that if we don't learn from that, we d build scar tissue on our soul, and now we just start to think it's our human good, it's our human good, it's our human good. And then we become a religion. <laughs> I do the Stations of the Cross, I'll be saved. I take communion. I'll be saved. I say enough prayers, I'll be saved. That's all human good. Human power, human strength. The power and the strength is in God, the Holy Spirit, who has been sent from Jesus Christ. As he said, I'll send my spirit in other scriptures. And in regard to that, once he realized that Peter through his remorse, recalled the Bible doctrine, now in repentance, knowing that he had failed, now face to face with the Lord once again, Peter, do you love me? And this time he knew his heart. This time he knew that Peter actually did love him. And now Peter was operating from divine viewpoint, divine perspective, and divine power. And he wasn't dealing with his human power, his human resources, and his human assets. You know I love you. You know I love you. And then what does the Lord say? Go do this, go do that. Let's go do this, go do that. Help the church, help the church, help the church. Help the unbeliever come to salvation. Once they come to salvation, help them grow. Feed them, feed them, tend them, guard them, protect them. You do that with the Word of God and all the these spiritual gifts that I've given to you. And then at the end, follow me. Follow me. Well, wait a minute. Jesus is up there in heaven. How's he following Jesus anymore? He's not following him around in the ministry through Israel. How's he following Jesus? By having his word resonant within his soul and applying that to life situations. And doing as the Lord command. To feed, to tend, to guard, and protect bring the unbeliever into the fold and then once believers are in the fold then tend to them tend to them tend to them help them help them help them and if we too love our lord that's what we'll be doing too but when we don't love our lord that's when we get caught up in the world and our human good our material things and everything else that comes along with it but when we love the Lord, we follow Him, we follow Him, we follow Him. And we take His lead through the power and the filling of God the Holy Spirit. 
All right, so let's close. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and this great object lesson that we learned from Peter's failures, Father, and we know that we fail too, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, many days and many times. And Father, we just ask that you lead us through your spirit to help to learn from our mistakes and learn from the word that is in our souls so that we go forward in your plan, glorifying you as we serve you, as we serve one another. So, Father, we thank you, and we ask for travel blessings on our way home. In Christ's precious name, amen.